Okay, if we could turn again to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 17, and we'll read till the end of the chapter. So Ephesians 5 verse 17, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two, they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So we're looking at uh, a section of the book that is dealing with the worthy walk. And it began in, in chapter uh, four, kind of, uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. And we've been looking at that idea of walking, walking in love, walking in light, uh, walking wisely. And under this uh, section of walking wisely, one of the things that will produce a wise walk is if we understand what God's will is and we walk in that will. And so he began that, this section with this verse that we reminded ourselves of, verse 17, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And that's really important, isn't it, to know what his will is. And what we find is that the will of the Lord, and I think we talked about this a little bit last time, is primarily moral. It's not so much where you are, it's what you are that is important. And if we're what we ought to be, if we're really walking the way we ought to, uh, in the will of God, morally, we'll be useful wherever we find ourselves geographically. And so here he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. And so he tells us one thing for sure, the will of God for a Christian is for them not to be drunk with wine. Now, that certainly was very, very common in the pagan world, just like in certainly Western culture today, uh, alcohol is a huge part of life. And uh, it's part of business life. It's part of uh, work life. Just the whole scenario, the, the alcohol dominates, certainly in the West. I realize in a Muslim country, it's a different story. But that's just, it dominates pagan society. We might put it that way, as it did then. And so certainly for the believer, it's God's will for them not to be drunk with wine. Now, instead, in contrast to this idea of being drunk with wine, uh, wherein he says is excess, but, and but is always a contrast word. A believer is not to be drunk with wine, but instead he is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting on the day of Pentecost, when the men were first baptized with the Holy Spirit and began to speak 
in other tongues, uh, the accusation was uh, these men are drunk with wine, nine o'clock in the morning, and they're drunk with wine. It's kind of interesting how the drunkenness and the Spirit's ministry are compared there. Uh, here, we see it again. Now, let's think about this idea of being filled with the Spirit. He says, we're not to be drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but we're to be filled with the Spirit. Now, most of the Holy Spirit's ministries to the believer are once and for all. They're sovereign acts of God. So, for instance, the day that you got saved, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you came under new management, and an amazing thing occurred. The Spirit of God took up residence in your life. He, he, all you did was you believed the gospel. As a result of believing the gospel, uh, your body became now a temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God came, took up residence in you. But it was it was a sovereign act of God, placing his Spirit within you. Uh, the baptism, uh, again, of the Holy Spirit happened at conversion. Not only was the Spirit placed in you, you were placed into the body of Christ. Uh, the, the sealing of the Spirit, the earnest of the Spirit, uh, the gift, engiftment by the Spirit, all occurred at conversion and were not dependent on us. They were sovereign acts of God. When we come to the filling of the Holy Spirit, now it's a different situation. These other things were wrought in us by the Holy Spirit at the time of conversion. They're irreversible. They're irrevocable. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is different. It's conditional because it depends on our cooperation with the indwelling Spirit of God. Okay, we're going to think more about that. It depends on our cooperation with the indwelling Spirit of God. In the previous section, we've seen the contrast between light and darkness. And now we've got another contrast between the drunkenness of the pagan world and the filling of the Holy Spirit of the child of God. We're told not to be drunk with wine, the result being excess or dissipation. Instead, now we're to be filled with the Spirit. Now, the tense uh, in the original language is this. Not a one-off thing, but it's it, we might write it like this. Be ye continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, not just a one-off thing, but we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, a drunk is controlled by alcohol, and it affects his walk, it affects his talk, and it affects his inhibitions. And so you, 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 can, you can spot a drunkard. Uh, you can, their speech is slurred. They talk rubbish, right? Their, their talk gives them away. Uh, they can't walk straight. They're, they're like, well, the book of Proverbs says they're like a, a, a sailor on a ship in the midst of a storm. They're, they're going this way and they're going that way. They can't walk straight. And then their inhibitions. They're, people often call alcohol Dutch courage. People do things under the influence of alcohol that they would not normally do when they're sober. And so it has a tremendous effect on a person's life. And so in the same way, he says, a man who is under the control of the Holy Spirit will be deeply affected as well in his walk, in his talk, and also in his inhibitions. A man who is under the control of the Holy Spirit, he's going to walk in a very definite way. <laughs> he's going to walk soberly he's going to walk righteously he's going to walk in holiness uh his talk is going to be affected we're going to see that as we see the the consequences of the spirit-filled life in verses 19 through 22 uh there's going to be a definite action and it will have effect on his speech and it will also uh affect his inhibitions instead of lowering his standards it's going to raise his standards because he's under the control of the holy spirit <laughs> and the holy spirit will not allow him if he's under that control to do things that are contrary now notice uh, we said you can spot a drunkard but scripture would tell us you can also spot a man who is filled with the holy spirit how do we know that when you look back please keep your finger in ephesians but look back with me to the book of acts and chapter six 
in verse 3. And this is how we can say definitively that a man who is controlled by the Holy Spirit, that we can, we can see clearly that he is. Acts 6, verse 3, when there was a need of uh, help um, to uh, stop the apostles being sidetracked uh, from devoting themselves to the word of God, they needed somebody who would do certain tasks to uh, alleviate a crisis in the church. And this is the criteria. The, the believers themselves were to select these men and notice the criteria that they were to use. Verse 3, wherefore, brethren, Look ye out among yourselves seven men of honest report. So again, we they're going to be handling finances. They're going to be handling the church's resources. So we don't want another Judas. They must be men of honest report. They have a good reputation of integrity. But then the second criteria is they must be men who are full of the Holy Ghost in wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so the church are given these qual qualities. Pick these men. One of them is they got to be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I wonder if we were to ask your assembly, could you pick out seven men full of the Holy Spirit? Would you know what to look for? They obviously knew because it tells us in verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So at least when it came to Stephen, they got him right, right? He was a man full of the Holy Spirit. They were able to spot it. So what does it look like? What does this man who is full of the Holy Spirit really look like? Another thing just to say before we, uh, back in Ephesians 5, before we look at what it really looks like to be filled with the Spirit, when he talks about be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, just want to mention that word excess for a moment, because it's the same word that's used in Luke chapter 15 about the word prodigal. Remember the prodigal son? And it literally means the inability to save. Uh, it means a waste of resources. And there's one thing for sure, that people who are drunkards, they're not good stewards. <laughs> they waste a lot of resources, right? Because sin is expensive. Um, I always am amazed uh, as we go shopping in the supermarket, uh, you'll see people in their, their supermarket trolley or cart, it often is full of bottles of vodka and whiskey and all these things. And if you've ever looked at the price of those things, it's really expensive. And it really is wasteful, wasteful resources uh, to, to spend that kind of money uh, to destroy your liver uh, seems to me uh, to be bad stewardship. <laughs> and that's exactly what they're doing. So it's the idea of waste of resources. Now, the, the drunkard gets his way, gets that way as a result of consumption. He consumes large quantities of alcohol. Now, again, I want to make a comparison with the spirit-filled life. Now, I want to just say this, that when we look at Ephesians 5, the, the evidence, if you like, or the, the characteristics of a spirit-filled person is going to be their speech. We're going to see that verse 19. They're going to speak in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, we're going to see it in terms of their general attitude. They're going to be very thankful people, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things. And then verse 21, we're going to see it in connection with their willingness to submit to one another. Okay, so there are certain characteristics that mark out a spirit-filled person. When you look at Colossians 3, I want you to look there and think about this idea of consuming. Uh, Colossians 3, not only is the drunkard a consumer, but the spirit-filled person is a consumer. Colossians 3.16 says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, what you'll notice is if you were to lay those two passages side by side, you would see that the characteristics of somebody who lets the word of Christ dwell in him richly 
and a person who's filled with the spirit are identical. There's a new song, there's a thankful heart, and there's a submissiveness to one another. And yet, one is be filled with the spirit, the other is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so what we could say is this, that just as the drunk imbibes liquor, the believer, he allows God's word to go into, he consumes it, he, he takes it in. You know, uh, alcohol, it comes into your system and then it's processed and it has its impact on your body. The word of God is meant to come in now, not just to our heads, but to our hearts and our wills. And as we allow it to really uh, have its way in our lives, we increasingly become under the spirit's control because who was the author of scripture supernaturally? Holy men of God spake. What does the scripture say? as they were moved, borne along by the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And it's what it's God breathed, that idea of inspiration, the very breath of God. It's the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. So as I allow God's word to control more and more of my life by taking it in, not just my head, but it just begins to control my thinking, uh, my actions, my activity, I am more and more coming under the control of the Holy Spirit. So we might challenge ourselves as we face this new year together. How much of the word of God affecting my life? Is it really changing my ways? Is it really affecting my daily conduct? Now, we just want to think about this too. We mentioned the baptism of the Holy Spirit that means I belong to the body of Christ. It, it, when I'm on the, the day of Pentecost, they were baptized into one body, 120 men in the upper room, one new man came out. They, they were placed into the body of Christ. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit means I belong to the body of Christ. The fullness of the Holy Spirit means my body belongs to Christ. I'm yielding my body to the control of Christ through the indwelling spirit. It's nothing less than God in command and control of a man's whole life. Let me just say this. See, the Holy Spirit is a person. And when he came and took up residence in your life, you didn't get part of him. You got all of him. Because he's a person, right? You either got him or you didn't get him. <laughs> if you were truly saved, you got the whole Holy Spirit. But the question is not, did you get the whole Holy Spirit? The question in terms of being filled with the Spirit is, does he have all of you? Are we yielding all of our life to his control? Just as the drunk is controlled by alcohol, the believer is to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, alcohol is often sold as wines and spirits. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And a person that's drunk is under control of the spirits that he's drinking. The believer, as he yields fully to the spirit's control, is also under the control, and it will have a definite effect upon him. Now, this effect that the, the spirit will have on a believer's life the consequences, if you like, which we're going to be looking at from verse 19 onwards. The consequences are, one is that it's going to have an effect on his home life. It's going to affect his marriage. It's going to affect his children. And it's true, um, the, the drunkard, <laughs> it definitely has a very negative effect on his home life. And uh, I remember uh, hearing the story of a, uh, uh, a very skeptical school teacher ridiculing the idea of God turning water into wine. And a young girl in the class put her hand up and said, in our home, God has turned wine into furniture. And the teacher said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, my father was a drunkard and we, we didn't have furniture in our house. My dad drunk all his wages. <laughs> uh, we... And then he came to know Jesus Christ, and now we have a proper home. 
we have furniture, we have food, right? It's changed everything. And it really is, it does, it, alcohol affects a home. The, the control of the Holy Spirit affects a home, affects a marriage, affects how we relate to children, all of these things. So verse 19, one of the effects of being controlled by the Holy Spirit is that it will result in speaking. Now notice King James, is, and again, I, I checked it in the Greek. It's correct. Speaking to yourselves. So this is not so much speaking of corporate worship but it's or praise, but it's speaking of individual. Speaking to yourselves, one to another. Uh, sorry, that's I'm reading the wrong verse. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The Bible does talk about the song of the drunkard, doesn't it? Psalm 69 and verse 12 talks about the song. Of, and drunks tend to sing, and not very tunefully, but they do. Um, because there's a, there's a certain aspect of alcoholism that is connected to joy. Wine uh, is uh, a symbol of joy in the scriptures. And so oftentimes a drunk will sing. But a believer who's under the spirit's control, well, just like Psalm 40 says, he put a new song in my heart, even praise to our God. And so a true believer who's under the spirit's control will have a song. And that song, you'll, you'll speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. Uh, and that's the idea of uh, like with with string a stringed instrument strings of a harp is that idea of making melody but the idea is this that god is actually pulling the strings of the heart of the believer to bring out a song making melody in your heart to the to the lord and so this song now let's just think about the psalms of course that's the old testament psalter which has always been incorporated into the songs of the people of God. And interesting that in the Church of Scotland, they only sing psalms. That's kind of an interesting thing, that they sing from the, uh, the Scottish Psalter, and they only sing psalms. But, of course, here it says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So it's more than that uh, in the Bible. But, but certainly the psalms is, and, of course, we heard a brother the other morning. I'm on a prayer group usually at this time every morning. And uh, we always start with one of the brothers singing. And one of the brothers started with singing Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And beautiful, right? It's, it's singing from the Psalms. Hymns. Now, it, again, it, interestingly enough, in pagan culture, they, they, they had hymns. And they were, they were songs that would eulogize and speak well of some deity or cultural hero. And the child of God also sings, but not to some pagan deity, but he sings songs that are designed to elevate and speak well of the Lord Jesus and of God. And of course, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? We have hymnology is a wonderful, wonderful thing. We are so richly blessed with the treasure of hymns. And we need to know the hymn book as well as our Bibles and use it in songs. Uh, and again, uh, that melody in the heart, it might not sound very melodious because some of us do not have good voices, but it's a melody in the heart that is coming to the Lord that brings worship to him. And then spiritual songs, is set in contrast to secular songs. Some of us, before we were saved, we used to often sing secular songs. But now, the, the depressing uh, kind of songs of the secular world are no longer part of the child of God's vocabulary. He now sings songs of a different caliber. They're ones that are spiritual in nature. And so, again, one of the evidences, and of course, we see a classic example of spirit-filled men singing praise to God, even when the circumstances weren't favorable. Acts 16.25, uh, here's Paul and Silas, and it says in verse 25 of Acts 16, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Uh, they, their backs are bleeding, they're in the inner prison, uh, they're in stocks, and what do they do? 
they have a praise meeting. <laughs> Who's in control? Uh, I tell you, it's not the flesh, because in the flesh, they would be imbibing in a big pity party at that particular moment, wouldn't they? They'd be saying, woe is us. Why did we even come here? We shouldn't have listened to that vision of the Macedo man of Macedonia. And it would just be a terrible part party of self-pity. But they're under the control of the Spirit of God. And what are they doing? They're praying and they're singing praises to God. So what a wonderful thing. Secondly, Thanksgiving, uh, another evidence of the man who is under the control of God, the Holy Spirit, is he'll be a thankful man. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, giving thanks for all things. See, there's some things it's easier to give thanks, thanks for, but all things. God, I got COVID again. <laughs> Can I be thankful for that? Well, it says in all things. I'll give you an example, classic example. I think it's a wonderful example. Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, uh, he uh, offered prayer of thanksgiving to God. Now, when did he do this? Uh, well, he did this after he had been robbed. And this is what his prayer said. He said, I thank thee first because I was never robbed before. And then he says, second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Thirdly, that although they took my all, it was not much. And fourthly, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. Now, I'll tell you something. It's hard to discourage a man with that kind of mindset, isn't it? <laughs> That's a thankful spirit, isn't it? Uh, he is so thankful, even in the midst of what we would consider to be a disaster, he is a man who's got a thankful heart. Well, uh, again, as we allow ourselves to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, we might see that more and more lived out in our lives. And the third one is submission. Uh, this is a difficult one. Um, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The, the idea of submission, it's a military term, and it means to rank under submission to one another it, it it implies lowliness and meekness as we saw early on in chapter 4 verse 2 uh, that if we're going to have unity it's going to require lowliness and meekness so this idea of submitting to one another it's um it not only affords the final evidence of being filled with the spirit but it forms the basis of the teaching of this next section since the submission is mutual, it's to one another, it's reciprocal. There's no thought of superiority or inferiority in this. It's to one another. This is a general. Before we get to the specifics of the husband-wife relationship, it's talking in a general sense, in the life of an, of an assembly. I can't always get my own way in the local assembly. Sometimes I have to submit to the desires of other brethren right? And that's the idea. Uh, submitting. Uh, it, it's a deference to each other. Above and beyond natural politeness, it, it, it replaces the idea of demanding we always get our own selfish way. Submission will be done, it tells us, in the fear of the Lord. I'm not submitting because I'm afraid of man. I'm not submitting because I'm afraid of what a man will do. I'm submitting because I'm walking in the fear of God. And so I'm not going to be somebody that always demands my own way, which is a recipe for devastation in the local assembly if we do that. We also see this, how important it is to, to, to take this under rank, this uh, in the military. Um, if people didn't take this position of submission, they would call it mutiny. Right? It's it's rebelling against the authorities. And so just as an army would be in confusion and chaos, so society would be in chaos without submission to one another. So, so let no man be so tenacious of his own will and his own opinion in matters that are indifferent as to disturb the peace of the church. In all such matters, give way to each other and let love rule. One writer says this, that the opposite of submission is self-assertiveness. 
I want my way and it's my way or the highway. Now that's the flesh. It really is not the man controlled by the spirit. And let me just say this. Uh, one of the things at the conference, a big conference I was at, you get to talk to a lot of people and some people are really hurting. That's the value of those conferences, not just the public ministry, but it's the private conversations. And I had several conversations, but let me just say this. I don't have to go into any details, but I can say this, that it, almost in every instance, the chaos that they were describing that had broken their hearts comes down to this. Believers walking in the flesh, not under the control of the spirit. And because they're walking in the flesh, they're demanding their own way. They're pushing their own agenda and they don't care about the consequences. And the result is always chaos. And so submit to one another. And, and here's the big thing in the fear of God. Right. So that's got to be the governing principle in the fear of God. And one of the great tra tragedies of our society, and this is another subject, but uh, a breakdown of a culture is when there's no fear of God before their eyes. And it affects an assembly as well. When we lose. The, the flesh um, the, the flesh doesn't want to sing songs of praise. <laughs> it, it wants to do its own thing and, and, uh, and often grouse and complain. Uh, it's certainly not thankful, and it's certainly not willing to submit to others. Who do they think they are expecting me to do what they say, right? The flesh doesn't want to do that. So how we need to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. So now he comes to the home and the glorious effects in the home. He says, wives... Uh, submit yourselves unto your own husbands in the Lord <clears throat> or as unto the Lord. So in the marriage, um, now one of the things we want to say, let's get it out up front because we've got 10 minutes left and we might not get to the end of this. But one, one thing I want you to see here is this, that in this section, what he's going to do is talking about the marriage relationship, but he's saying actually the marriage is a picture of something bigger. It's a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. And in this picture, this great mystery, I speak of Christ in the church, the man represents Christ and the wife, the husband represents Christ and the wife represents the church. Okay, that's the picture. And so he says here, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, and so why does a wife submit to her husband as unto the Lord? Well, it tells us, it gives us the reason. Firstly, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, verse 23, and he is the savior of the body. So he gives two reasons. First of all, the lordship of Christ. Submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. The, the importance of the lordship of Christ. Secondly, uh, the headship of the man, which is also clearly stated, just as Christ is the head of the church, the man is to be the head of the woman or the husband of the wife. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So the application is pretty simple. To submit means to recognize someone has legitimate authority over you. It means you recognize there's an order of authority and that you're part of a unit, a team, and you as an individual are not more important than the working of the unit or the team. The husband is to be the leader, now not the tyrant, because he's to model himself as Christ, of, it, uh, with Christ. Husband is to be the leader, not a tyrant. Uh, he's to lovingly carry out the role of headship as planned by Christ. And of course, from 1 Corinthians 11, he's to be under the headship of Christ, right? Uh, Christ is the head of the man. And so it's loving leadership and willing submission. 
Each wife is to submit to the leadership given by her husband, given to her husband by God. Now, it's very difficult in our me-centered society to even see yourself as a unit, as one. I mean, that's one of the great teachings here, that the husband and wife become one flesh. And so it's a team. We're a team, and the man is to be the, the leader. The woman is to willingly submit. But verse uh, again, verse 24, it, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, again, we've got, to, we've got to see, what do we mean by this in everything? As the church is subject to Christ, so the wife is to be subject to her husband in everything. Of course, the man, we've already said from 1 Corinthians 11, let's just read that just to make sure we understand it. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. And so the idea is, the implication is this, that the, the man needs to be getting his direction from Christ his head, and then the woman submits to the man who is also in submission to Christ. If he asks the wife to submit to him in an area that would cause her to sin, then it basically eliminates the principle of the lordship of Christ in verse 22. Remember, wives submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord. Now, the Lord would never ask a wife or his bride to do something that is contrary to the word of God. So the, the, the wife has to submit to her husband in everything, but that everything is governed by the idea that it, it doesn't mean something immoral. It doesn't mean something contrary to the word of God, because we see here it, it's as unto the Lord. And, and I just want to just run through this just for a second, because it's really interesting how the lordship of Christ and being conscious of God is, is kind of over this whole section. So, for instance, in verse 19, we saw the making melody in your heart was to the Lord. Verse 21, the submission is in the fear of God. In verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, chapter 6, verse 4, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then verse 7, uh, speaking of the employer-employee or servant-master, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not unto man. The idea is this, you've got to bring the Lord into the picture. OK, I'm, I'm doing this as unto the Lord. I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm going to. Uh, so, so the wife may be far more smart and intelligent than the husband. <laughs> right. Just in the military, you could have a private that's a lot smarter than a general. <laughs> uh, right. It, it didn't mean that because a man's a general, he's a better man than 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 a private. Uh, but it, the idea is this. I recognize the lordship of Christ, and I'm going to obey the word of God, and I'm going to submit. Now, I don't mean to say you don't have to, uh, you, you can't give advice or say, are you sure about this? What about, you know, the implications and all the rest of it? But there needs to be this submission. And again, it's keeping the lordship of Christ in view. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church now in the last three minutes i want to just do this one of the things he talks about when he talks about christ's love for the church he shows that it's a long-term love so for instance it goes back into the past love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it now when did he do that well he did that in redemption and he did that 2,000 years ago. So he loved the church when he gave himself for it. So it's the past. Redemption is in view. In the present, Christ loves the church. And what is he doing with it? Well, in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So in the past, redemption. In the present, he loves the church by sanctifying it using the word of God to make it more holy, more pure, uh, more beautiful. And then in the future, 
he's loves the church because in glorification he's going to present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and so what we should say is this that the obvious implication is this that marriage is a lifelong commitment our lord's love and commitment to his bride is not short-lived it's long term goes back in the past <laughs> goes in extends into the eternal future and it's in the present as well and so he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word what is christ doing with his church right now well he's sanctifying the church using the word of god you are clean through the words I have spoken unto you. John 15, 3. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. God is making the church a holy bride by using his word to change them and make them beautiful. And so the husband, the spiritual leader, also needs to be concerned about presenting his wife at the judgment seat of Christ uh, in a holy condition. And so how does he do that? Well, he's going to use the word of God. He's going to take spiritual leadership, the family altar, if you like, devotions, praying together, uh, spiritual input. The church will, isn't it wonderfully encouraging, by the way, that the church, for all of its difficulties and all of its faults, there's a coming day, verse 27, that he's going to present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish that's the glorious destiny of the church of god well i'm sorry we didn't get to complete but it's really the same picture all the way through it's this analogy of christ's love for the church and the husband's love for the wife paralleling each other and again it would be very just as the church is to submit to christ and it's eat and obey christ because well it's easy to do it because he's so loving so the wife is to submit to their own husband in the lord to reverence him to submit to him and of course christ uh, the church is or the husband is to love his wife like christ loved the church that's the challenge for us men are we doing that are we loving our wives like Christ loved the church? May God help us. And we can't do it in our own strength. It's only as we're under the control of the blessed Holy Spirit will that ever happen. Let's just uh, ask the Lord to bless this section. Father, we're thankful for the word of God. And Lord, it's it's sometimes the word of God is, is easy enough to explain, but very difficult to live because our flesh militates against these things, against submission. Uh, it militates against this life of continual thanksgiving. It militates uh, against this uh, this song, uh, Lord, because we the, the flesh often dominates. Lord, we pray for a church that knows more of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and it will indeed be a glorious church if we're all under the control of that blessed person. So help us to to yield to Him fully and hold nothing back, and we'll give thee the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.